So what we try to do is think of what can we do nice for people like you in addition to thanking and thanking you, which we do. And uh, one of the things we like to do is to share some of the intellectual capital that exists around the school. And I'm particularly pleased tonight to uh, introduce two people that are very special to our school. They are both alums. I don't think we've ever had a program like this where we could bring two alumni together and two such distinguished alums. And it's a probably the only pair like this in American higher education, a father-daughter team. So let me introduce the team. I'll start with the daughter on my immediate left, Jennifer Rocker, who's a graduate of our PhD program in 1995. Uh, she went from here to UCLA to make a reputation and do lots of great stuff, and we were fortunate to attract her back here to join our faculty. She came, I think, about the same time I did in 1999, so uh, she's been here 10 years now with us off and on. And uh, she is a real star and leader at the school. She's a professor of marketing, a chaired professor. Uh, her expertise lies in the psychology of time, money, and happiness, something none of us have quite enough of. But, uh, <laughs> how's that for an area to probe in depth, the psychology of time, money, and happiness? Uh, Jennifer is a fantastic uh, member of our faculty. She's also been a faculty member at the Haas School over at Berkeley, but we're really pleased that her focal point now is at the Stanford Business School. Uh, she's a stellar researcher and has had lots and lots of publications and recognition in her field of marketing. Uh, she's a super teacher, and uh, she has won the MBA Teaching Award, which is something very few faculty win, and those of you who were MBAs here, which is most of you know, this is a pretty important recognition voted by the students. And she's also a real leader in the school. She was a member of the group that uh, came forward with a new curriculum that we're now into our second year of implementation. And she's a member now of the Dean Search Committee looking for a new dean, which will take us to even better and higher places. So that's Jennifer Ocker, and on her left is David Ocker. Uh, Dave was a PhD graduate also of the Stanford Business School in 1969, a little bit earlier than Jennifer, obviously. Uh, and Dave uh, is also in marketing. Uh, how is this, father-daughter marketing wizards? Um, his work focuses on brands and brand building and on brand portfolio strategy and managing marketing across silos. Uh, he's probably got even more books and publications than Jennifer, but then he's had a lot longer to work at it. He's got, I think, 14 books. Uh, the latest one is on spanning silos, if you haven't seen it, and everybody knows about silos and the need to span them. Uh, Dave was a longtime member of the faculty at the business school at Berkeley, and he's now an emeritus member of the faculty. But in addition, he has a consulting firm that he's the vice chairman of called Profit, which does a lot of consulting on marketing and brand strategy and related uh, activities in the corporate world. So we're really fortunate to have dueling professors in conversation. I don't know how this is going to work, but I'm turning it over to Jennifer and Dave Ocker. Please welcome them. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be here. I went to school with Bob. In fact, I tutored him in marketing so he could pass his generals. I, I, I want you to know I'm, I'm good. I'm good. But, you know, there was a time in which I was the featured speaker, not the warm-up. <laughs> and, and there was a time when people called me to ask me to speak to their group without saying at the outset, you know, we tried Jennifer, but he was, she wasn't available. <laughs> Um, let me just, uh, yeah, uh, Bob uh, introduced Jennifer. She's, she's really terrific. She's a, a wonderful person, and she's won three teaching awards, actually. She's, uh, and, and her classes are over, oversubscribed. Her class just finished today, and she had these groups do, uh, applying social technology. And one group uh, uh, was was interested in, in donors, getting don organ donors. And in one month, they got 45 
thousand people to view their website, which was organ donating is sexy, and they got <laughs> 88 people to donate organs. Uh, and that was just one of her groups in, in just today's class. And she's an incredible researcher, you know, 28 articles, three best paper awards, and uh, you could argue she's actually created four new fields of research for her field. Um, it's really quite, uh, quite remarkable. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that I'm responsible, uh, especially for her fast start, <laughs> that it was my influence and in mentoring and so on. That's not true, actually. Actually, when she started out, she had two, uh, two th kind of things top in her mind. One was to try to avoid appearing too young. So she used to wear glasses and put her hair up and, and uh, everything so she would get respect. And the second thing she was, she wanted to not be associated with me because I was perceived as managerial and she wanted to be perceived as academic. And uh, so, uh, so the, the influence wasn't as you might expect. Um, my charge is to give you an overview of my research, a few headlines, and to kind of relate that uh, to Jennifer and give you kind of a little bit of an insight into Jennifer. So uh, that's what I'm going to do. My field in the last 20 years is focused on brand strategy. I started off doing research on brand extensions, um, and, uh, and then I did some research relating brand equity to stock return. Turns out that brand equity has nearly as much impact on stock return as does earnings. Um, and then I did some work on emotional benefits. I, I studied the emotion of warmth. And uh, we showed how to create warmth and, and what warmth can also do to the ROI of the business. And then in the late 80s, brand equity started to emerge. And I wrote a, my first book called Managing Brand Equity, my first brand book. and. Uh, I kind of define brand equity, and, and just to define brand equity as an asset completely changed marketing. I mean, it wasn't my book, but it was the fact that this construct emerged. And uh, so now all of a sudden, marketing is strategic instead of tactical. It's the job of the CEO and not the advertising manager. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it changes the way you look at marketing, it changes the way you fund brand building activities. And to also, I defined it as including uh, the customer uh, base and the loyalty of the customer base. And that also really influenced the way people viewed marketing and ran marketing. And then uh, five years later, I wrote a book, Building Strong Brands, that tried to show people how to create brand equity. And uh, the heart of the book was the, the concept that a brand is more than a three-word phrase. It's actually multidimensional. It has usually eight to 12 dimensions. And among these dimensions are brand personality very, uh, uh, dimensions, like uh, being energetic and being approachable. And they are also uh, organizational associations, like uh, concern for consumer, being innovative and uh, which are properties of the organization and not necessarily the product. And then you, uh, it also uh, suggested that you create three or four of these uh, elements as the most important and use them to drive your marketing program. The third book I wrote in 2000 was, uh, can it gave you the, the generation two of the brand identity model. And it also talked about how do you go about building your brand? How do you translate the brand identity into brand building programs? And one suggestion, for example, was you look at role models, both inside the company and outside the company. If you want to be perceived as innovative, you look at, at, at people or programs that are innovative, and you look outside your company to other companies that have pulled it off. And you, and you say, how do they do it? And, and uh, see if you can get some ideas. And the uh, fourth book was Brand Portfolio Strategy, and that recognized the fact that most brands have, uh, or most companies have multiple brands. They have family of brands or portfolio brands, and they're usually a mess. And in fact, sometimes some companies, are, it's so messy that they're paralyzed. They can't even come up with a new product because they, they don't know what to call it. The brands are a mess. 
And so what this book did is try to sort that out and suggest that each brand should have a role. And these brands as a family should combine to create clarity, synergy, and leverage. And in, in the book, I suggested the concept of a branded energizer. It turns out we know from recent research that uh, the most important element of a brand today is not differentiation, it's not relevance, it's energy. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. The brands that lack energy are going downhill. And, and this is true across the board and it's been true for eight or nine years. The brands with energy are a whole different story. And it, it's really hard to generate energy. I, I mean, not, not everybody can be a Nintendo or an Apple. I mean, if you make frankfurters, or if you're in the insurance business, it's a little hard to get people excited. <laughs> and uh, I say that because my good friend is the head of an insurance company is sitting in the second row. <laughs> uh, but uh, in that case, my advice is to find something with energy and brand it and attach your brand to it. Like the Avon Walk for Breast Cancer, for example. That's a brand that's now 16 years old, gives Avon enormous energy. They've raised, uh, incidentally, $560 million for cancer. It's, uh, it, so it's not just talk. Uh, but, but anyway, that's a suggestion for getting energy. You know, I have to say that uh, when Jennifer's dissertation came out, the, she developed a scale for brand uh, personality, a scale that revitalized that whole area. Uh, and I thought to myself, man, she is following in my footsteps. And she very patiently explained to me, you're a brand strategist, you deal in brand personality. I, on the other hand, am an experimental psychologist. I deal in the self-expressive characteristics of consumers. So uh, careful to provide some distance. But then uh, 2002, which was now five years after her thesis, no, seven years, she taught a course in brand strategy at Stanford, and, and she chose my book as a text. I didn't call it brand strategy. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> called it brand planning. Just of course, <laughs> of course. Um, but she chose a book that was 11 years old, Managing Brand Equity. I said, Jennifer, why? And she said, well, you know, I, I, I haven't read any of those books, and I was un <laughs> under time pressure, and I just picked one. <laughs> But he said, on my to-do list is to read those books. <laughs> Another thing I've done is, is write a book on, on marketing strategy, really business strategy. I wrote this uh, in, in the early 80s. It's now in its ninth edition, so I'm continually to, continuing to write it. And the headline of that book is that you need to de-emphasize short-term financials. And you instead have to focus on building assets and competencies. And you have to know how to manage your brand globally, managing across markets. So I thought I, her, uh, Jennifer's second article, which was very influential, uh, was on global management, I thought. So I thought, well, ha ha, she is uh, taking my advice to go into global management area. And she said very patiently, Dad, you're a global marketing strategist that deals in things like global brand management. I, on the other hand, am an experimental psychologist. I deal in cross-cultural consumer behavior. So again, little effort at separation. <laughs> uh, my latest book came out last October. It's called Spanning Silos, The New CMO Imperative. And uh, what I sort of found in working with executives and companies on, on brand, and especially trying to help them manage their brand globally, is that there's some, some really serious silos. And um, uh, there's, pro there's country silos and or regional silos, but there's also product silos. I mean, Toshiba must have 30 or 40 different product divisions, each with their own marketing department. And in addition to that, there's functional silos. Within marketing, we have sponsorship, we have advertising, we have PR, we have uh, internet and, and call centers and on and on. And, and these silos basically, you know, very comfortable being isolated from each other. They regard the other silos as competitors. And, and that's really served 
American business well for almost 100 years, since 1922 when Alfred Sloan started this uh, decentralization organizational structure. But it, it, it just doesn't work anymore. I mean, it just doesn't because products, brands, uh, uh, customers, marketing, they span silos. And you just can't have these autonomous silos. You know, among other things, the brand coordination is a complete mess because all these silos are taking the brand in, in their own direction. And there's, uh, as a result, the brand gets confused, not only in the marketplace, but also internally. So people in the organization really doesn't, don't know what the brand stands for, and then they can't obviously deliver. Um, if, you know, pro each of these silos don't have enough budget to really engage in effective marketing because effective marketing these days requires scale. You know, a, a major sponsorship, uh, for example. Uh, even a major advertising campaign uh, requires scale. And so you have to find a way to, uh, uh, to work across silos to develop marketing programs. And also, uh, in offerings, customers don't want to buy components anymore. They want to buy systems. So IBM, for example, has to find a way to get these silos to work together to provide systems for, for customers. You know, Walmart wants to deal with Procter & Gamble. They don't want to deal with, with 30 divisions of Procter & Gamble. They want one entity to deal with all their logistics, all their ordering, all their promotions, and so on. So you, you've got to, you know, be able to span silos in order to deal with uh, offerings that are demanded by the marketplace. And re resource allocation with independent silos is really dysfunctional. And of course, these days, you know, that kind of waste just can't be tolerated. But what happens is the, uh, the established silos that have income coming in get to spend that income, and therefore they get the resources. And the new emerging silos don't. You know, at, at IBM, for example, that went on for years and years. Every year at the beginning of the year, they would say, we're going to allocate money and fund the new emerging silos in the emerging markets. And during the course of the year, the established silos would suck the, the investment back to them because they had a program, they were in New York, and, and so on, and they got the money. So finally, <coughs> IBM last year set up a completely separate organization for the emerging markets. It's headquartered in Shanghai. And now they're going to get the budget and they're going to keep it and they're going to invest it like they should. But it, it, it's such a, a dramatic organizational you know, change in order to make that happen. So um, I talked to over 40 CMOs of major companies throughout the world, and I asked them, you know, what are the problems with the silos and what are you doing that's working? And, and the book talks about a couple dozen things, but uh, a couple of the headlines are, that centralization and standardization should not be the goal of the CMO and the central marketing group, as it often is. And because what happens is it's, it, it, it leads to sort of too ambitious a program. And, and you, it leads to flame out. I mean, the average CMO's tenure is 23 months. That, that, that compares to over five years for a CEO. So. Uh, so you put a lot of stress on, on the organization, a lot of <laughs> expectations and pressure if you try to do too much. So the goal should be rather to address these problems, to try to create uh, brand coordination programs, offerings, and resource allocation, to deal with those problems. And anything you can do to replace competition and isolation with cooperation and communication will advance those things. So that should be your goal. And it might involve centralization. It might involve some standardization, but that shouldn't be the goal. Um, the second, a CMO can go a long way toward that goal by acting as a facilitator, a consultant, or a service provider. Um, so for example, uh, Nestle has a center of excellence in, in around Hispanics and around uh, 
uh, mom and kids and so on, which a lot of their product silos have find relevant. So it's a vehicle, and then they have a steering committee that includes people from the silos, and it's a vehicle to really get together, to start communicating, start to relate to each other on a common issue. Again, it's not threatening, and uh, it, it moves the ball. Uh, consultant, you know, Visa, for example, it act as a consultant to all their country silos that uh, have brand tracking data. So they help them interpret this data, and they help them, you know, respond to the problems that it, it detects. And the service provider, you know, at BP, the Central Marketing Group does segmentation studies. And they've been so good and so effective that the silos are standing in line to try to get them to do a segmentation study for them. So um, that's a, a, a second headline. The third is you really need to leverage silo ideas. I mean, these days, we've got to find a way to do more with less. And that involves really good marketing ideas. And one way to get them is to let the silos work for you. Let them come up with ideas, then recognize them, and roll them out to the other silos. And uh, uh, you know, if you, the Dockers, for example, came from South America. Uh, Pantene's the hair is so healthy it shines. That came from Taiwan. McDonald's loving it came from Germany. But at each case, they had the presence of mind to recognize that excellence and immediately test and roll it out to other silos. Um, so uh, uh, just one, a couple more things about Jennifer before <laughs> I turn the thing over. You know, you ask yourself, why is she so successful? And uh, uh, one reason is she multitasks. She's always multitasking. And everybody in the family can, can know if they're talking to her on the telephone, if she's away from her computer, you're getting about 90% of her. If she's on the computer just reading email, you're getting about 60%. And if she's writing email, you're getting 30%. <laughs> and uh, you, you, it's, it's you know, quite easy to tell. Uh, <laughs> which is which. And uh, what else was I going to say about Jennifer? That's good. All right, so. <laughs> That's enough. Uh, what, has anybody been to Jennifer's class? Um, if, 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 if your attention wanders and you're in your class, she'll call on you, right? If you get a cell phone call, Whoever called becomes part of the class discussion. <laughs> it is so embarrassing. <laughs> and uh, so she's very helpful that way. She keeps you on your toes. Uh, well, if you want to know more about Jennifer, you can, <laughs> <laughs> you can read. I wrote a book on, uh, on my story so far, and uh, Jennifer is featured in the book, and you can read more. The, the, the one on the left, you see her first and last effort at yard work. Uh, in the middle top, you see her first and last effort to take a hike <laughs> in the wilderness. And on the right top, you see how, you know, that, that her flair for clothes and dressing and fashion started really early. <laughs> so I'll turn it over to Jennifer. She's a wonderful person in addition to being so talented, and she's my best friend. Aww. At least she was. Um, so it's so nice to be here. Thank you for um, creating this and for inviting us both here. Um, my dad is um, quite modest. He, um, let's see, oops, okay, I'll let someone else do that. Um, so I don't know if you remember this, but so I w let me just give me a little context while the presentation is getting set up. Um, so I grew up in this wonderful household, you know, with two sisters. Um, and I kind of knew at an early age that I wanted to do something interesting with my career and I wanted to have a great family. I knew I wanted to have kids and I wanted to be there for them and I wanted to have this interesting career. And I just, I sort of didn't know exactly how that was going to happen because uh, it's very hard to find role models who can do both um, well. 
So as I was growing up, I noticed that my dad would work off in his office creating all sorts of really interesting research and then periodically around 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock would come down for a snack. And, um, and so he would kind of come down, have a little bounty, go back up and uh, come back down, say, you want to play a little tennis? Let's go a little play a little tennis. Uh, take us out to play tennis and then go back up to his office and get some more research done. You know, 5 o'clock he comes over and he sort of has another snack and then he's like, well, what about, you know, skiing tomorrow? And, and I, of course, was the oldest daughter, so I said, no, i got too much work to do. But my two other sisters said, yeah, sign me up. Uh, that's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> so as I grew older and older, trying to figure out which career I'm going to take on, um, you know, my dad kept saying, like, have you, have you thought about about being an academic, and I thought, no, that's, that's insanity. Uh, I, would, I would never do that. Uh, and so I worked for IBM, at IBM for a little while, and um, that, didn't, that didn't work out you know, as well as I would have hoped. I worked uh, far too intensely. Uh, and so at the end of that summer, my dad said, have you thought about being an academic? And I said, that's insanity. I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I, I went off and I worked in advertising for a little while, and I remember my first interview. My boss at the time had said, you know, how do you foresee yourself working? And I said, you know, uh, in cafes, actually. Do you mind if I do a little work out of cafes? I don't know why he hired me, but somehow uh, he thought that was good. So that didn't work out great. And, and Dad kept saying, what about academic? And I thought, I had this mental image of him coming down at 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, playing tennis with us and stuff, and looking at it, he thrived. And I finally said, you know, this, this is a good job. This is, I don't know what I was beating myself up. And I have to tell you, I feel so blessed. Stanford is a tremendous, tremendous place. And I feel so fortunate to be here um, knowing you and, and, and speaking a little bit. Um, first of all, you're probably asking yourself, what have you been um, doing lately? Uh, your, your father has been producing uh, books on every two to three year basis. And what have you been producing? <laughs> Um, so this is my esoteric paper number one uh, that no one's read. Uh, that's the esoteric paper number two, which, um, you know, like 10, 11 people have read. Uh, the third uh, and then the fourth. Um, yeah, so you're probably wonder, wondering, you know, why so slow? You know, uh, there's no book covers up there. Uh, there's just esoteric papers up there. Uh, so I'd like to uh, defend myself for a second. And, um, and sort of mention why uh, I am so slow. Uh, so the first, the first reason is Taya Sloan. She's my three-year-old daughter. Uh, we've been working on makeup applications. So how to do it, best practices, uh, <laughs> role models. Uh, the second is Devin, Devin Smith. Uh, we've been working on things like motorcycle riding. He's you know six years old, so I figure introduce it at an early age. Uh, Pokemon collecting and Karate Kid training by Cooper Smith. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's been part of the problem, I would say. Uh, now, in Dad's defense, he's actually helped. Uh, he's, this is him uh, playing against the Pokemon uh, cartoon character, my husband, uh, at a recent birthday party. So you're, you're probably thinking uh, to yourself, you know, well, what are you going to talk about since you have not produced very much at all? Um, and I talked to my father about this. I said, you know, what should I, what should I do? Uh, and he said, Jennifer, try to dig deep into your arsenal of research. Don't you have anything that is, isn't completely esoteric? Remember back in 1997, you wrote a paper that had some implications that people find interesting? Why don't you talk about that? And so we had this internal debate. I thought, you know, I should just talk about a little bit of my you know, different research. And he said, no, find one thing that has some relevance somewhere and just hone in on that focus. Uh, so what I'd like to do instead is ignore that advice and then uh, instead talk about what I wanted to talk about, which is multiple papers that I find interesting. But I'm going to do so in a, in a way that hopefully will have some appeal. I'm going to do it in a way. Um, that emulates sort of how my dad summarizes my research so as to try and make it sound more interesting. Uh, so I'm going to turn you know, language into his and, uh, and unpackage it that way. Interesting finding number two in the first esoteric paper. Brands have personality. Who knew? Now, I just have to tell you, whenever my dad finds something really boring but wants to get other people engaged, he'll throw in that phrase, who knew? And, and so you're probably thinking, I, I knew that. I knew that. Uh, that was something that I knew. Uh, but, 
But the way he says it, it makes you think, well, maybe I did not know that. It's not, it's not clear I knew that. I, I, I thought I did before he said who knew. But now, I did not know that I knew that. So, so a little tip. This will be colored with uh, little tips for you to take home uh, to your own kids. So let me tell you a little bit about what he found interesting in the first esoteric paper published in 1997. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I worked in advertising for a while, and I found individuals uh, within that industry to be fascinated by the self-expressive role of brands um, or the emotional role of brands. This idea that uh, more people tattoo Harley on a part of their body than any other brand in the world <laughs> is not because Harley has a good functional benefit, right? It, it's not because it's quiet. It's not quiet. Uh, it's not because, uh, you know, it gets good gas mileage. Yeah, I do not know if it has good gas mileage. But, but it says something about you, right? It says something about you, and, and, the, and when you drive it, you feel a certain way. Uh, and yet, even though all of these advertising agencies uh, were so intrigued by this notion of understanding the personality with a brand, no one had a systematic or rigorous way of measuring it, right? So they would you know, have all the managers throw in random personality traits that they thought were interesting, trendy or exciting or cool or whatever. Uh, and it was done uh, 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 not systematically and at, on an ad hoc basis. So what we did uh, in this research, born at Stanford, was um, to systematically cover um, the world of traits. We started with over a uh, thousand personality traits. We had individuals um, rate over 40 different products, uh, brands, services, nonprofit and for-profit both on um, what was reduced down to 300 traits and through a factor analytic procedure uh, winnowed that uh, list of 300 traits down to 100 and then to 42 traits that represented five families of traits, if you will, five schemas that consumers, at least American consumers, use to think about brands. Uh, so that list was relatively robust. It wasn't owned by one brand like Levi's. It was generalizable across categories. And the five families of traits were called sincerity. These are the brands that garner trust. There is excitement. These are brands that um, get you excited. They're the energizers that my father was talking about. They're exciting, cool, trendy, young, imaginative, hip. They have got energy. The third family of traits, the, by the way, the first two explain 50% of the variance in uh, the personality space, so they're both very important. Uh, competence is credible, intelligent, hardworking, successful, leader, confident. Um, a lot of the hardware and software spaces claim they own competence. Uh, what they don't own necessarily is a secondary point of differentiation that, that pulls them apart from other hardware and software companies. The third di uh, dimension is called sophistication, which is upper class, uh, charming, feminine, smooth. Um, uh, it's like brands like Lexus. And the fifth is ruggedness, which is the Harley Davidsons of the world. It's rough and masculine and strong, tough, outdoorsy. Um, so now we have five families of traits that can be used to sort of systematically um, track brands over time and against other competitors. And we find through regression and other types of statistical means that uh, if you look at the relationship between market share and these five family, um, families of traits, first of all, 75% of the variance in mar uh, market share is explained. And across categories, the single dimension that has the highest correlation, the most significant beta coefficient with market share is sincerity. And that's even more important these days where trust and authenticity um, believed to be um, owned by an organization has greater sway than anything else. So these companies that garner trust effectively are incredibly important to watch. Interesting finding, too. Um, but those bundles of personality, uh, personalities, uh, my dad would say, aren't the same across cultures. Peacefulness is important in Japan and Spain. Passion is. Who knew? Uh, so you, you probably did, but uh, the way he said it. Um, so if you replicate this entire process in a bottom-up, emic-based way in Japan, starting with over 1,000 indigenous Japanese traits using global and local brands in Japan, and again, from a bottom-up process, uh, reveal the families of traits that exist in their minds. Five pop up, again, which probably resonates with some of you. There's something very special about that number seven, plus or minus two, in terms of cognitive structure. Um, and, um, but ruggedness uh, disappears. It doesn't exist as much in Japanese consumers' minds. Peacefulness pops up, which is peaceful, mild, calm, harmonious, uh, naive, um, mild-mannered. 
Um, it's almost like a geisha girl, if you will. Uh, ruggedness doesn't exist. That John Wayne notion of strong, rugged, masculine um, doesn't, doesn't pop up. And it, it, it raises really interesting questions if you are Nike, uh, Harley, or Levi's, or Marlboro. And in fact, in those cultures where uh, ruggedness doesn't exist nearly to the degree that it does in North American uh, countries, um, these, uh, these, these companies really just come across as one thing, which is American. <laughs> so you're either going to have to educate uh, other cultures about what ruggedness means, which takes a, a lot of time and money, or you, uh, you, you position yourself around excitement or some other dimension that Nike might own, but which has cross-cultural generalizability. Uh, in Spain, um, when we do this bottom-up uh, EMIT-based process, um, competence and sophistication collapse as a structure. And my uh, Spanish colleague at the time when I was trying to explain, you know, what's going on? Why would, you know, hardworking and successful leader, competent t type of set of traits collapse with sophisticated, um, glamorous, good-looking? And she said, you know, only in America would your presidents be so poorly dressed. That would never. <laughs> happen in Spain, uh, those two things intermingle, leaders look good. Um, <laughs> peacefulness also arose in other collectivist culture uh, like Spain and uh, passion, intensity, mystical, bohemian, spiritual, intense popped up. Interesting finding three, these personalities guide the consumer brand relationships and relationships are important, trust me. That's another thing Dad says uh, to kind of get you engaged. You know, you're starting to like nod off and he'll go, no, trust me, really, trust, trust me. And that makes you sort of uh, engaged. Let me give you a glimpse into uh, the research that went into this uh, insight. This is work done with Susan Fournier, uh, Adam Brazel and I. And what we did in one particular study is start to track, uh, you know, most, most companies, um, try to reach this area of uh, emotional rewards and having an intense and strong relationship. So if you look at the interpersonal relationships, marriage partner, best friends, close friends are up in the right-hand quadrant. Um, and what's, what's um, over on the left is compartmentalized friendships, childhood buddies, drinking buddies. Down here is casual acquaintances, master-slave relationship versus <laughs> Yeah, you're probably looking at the Marlboro Cable Vision and Microsoft. Microsoft, no matter what they do, no matter how much good they will do, people will just be pissed off, thinking, you know, this is a ma if I could get out of this relationship, I would. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a, an incredibly, I feel so bad, too, because the positive that Microsoft has done is really quite, it just makes you re realize, uh, first of all, there's a couple things in the interpersonal relationship world. Um, people's feelings about an individual are oftentimes assessed and understood within the first 10 sec seconds of meeting that individual. So you meet them incorrectly and you might as well just give up. Like it's all over. It's 10 seconds and that gives you that sort of window into the nature of the relationship. And the way to think about a relationship with a brand and a consumer or even within consumers is very much like, you know, I have one personality and Andre might have another personality and we might be very nice people. But there is something about the personality of that relationship that just doesn't work. And he could try, and I could try, and it is not going to work. Personalities are very robust, right? Um, and, 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 and they don't really change. And so if you're a brand or a, a consumer or an individual, understand the personality of that relationship intuitively and also build on it. And if you look at Starbucks versus Pete's, very different relationships. That the way you go into Starbucks and it's a long line and you think, there's a new barista here and I am going to go to the Starbucks next door. Uh, I'm not going to wait in this long line. Uh, at Pete's, you go and there's a long line and you say like, oh, it's a good barista. This is going to be a great cappuccino. I'm just going to settle in long line and hang out and talk to these people in the line. Uh, so the basic nature of the relationship is fundamentally different. Um, the next insight, think before you promise trust. Uh, we did one little experiment. This was um, one where we manipulated two brands. This was called, uh, it was a photography service brand we called uh, Captura. And we made um, the same brand very sincere. And we made the other brand very exciting. So both called Captura, but one was sincere at promise trust. The slogan was, life is too meaningful to let you pass it by, work with us. 
Uh, the exciting condition, so you were in the sincere condition, these guys are in the exciting condition. We said capture it because life is too uh, exciting to let you pass it by. Uh, and everything about it was very hip and cool and fun. So two same brands promise the same thing, but the language with which we spoke uh, nurture trust versus excitement. We, um, we had people interact with Captura over the course of two months. And um, we created four conditions on our experiment. So you guys interacted with Captura, the sincere brand, over the course of two months. And you came to our website to learn about us, et cetera. Now, everything went fine for you guys. But for half of you, uh, in two weeks into the relationship, by the way, we Federal Express do all disposable cameras. Two weeks into the relationship, we let you know that after we developed all of your online photos and put them on, just like Shutterfly or Easy, you know, Easy Share Kodak, et cetera, um, we told half of you we accidentally lost our online photos due to ISP problem. We're so sorry. Did the same thing with you guys. You guys, everything was fine. You're in the exciting group. Everything went fine for two months. Uh, for you, we said, oh, we're so sorry. We lost our online photos. You know. We really didn't mean to really apologize. Two days later, we came back to you guys and said, we worked very hard to restore your online photos. Please come back. We apologize. Uh, same thing with you guys. And we tracked relationship strength over the course of those two, minute, uh, two, two months. First set of findings. So the dark side of trust. For you, you had originally you know, kind of intriguing ideas about uh, the relationship strength with this Captura brand, you started off at four, you ended up around six. So by the end of the two months, you were engaged. You were loyal. You were going to tell friends about it. You trusted the brand. In contrast, um, you, who also started engaged in the beginning, uh, plummeted in terms of trust at time two, which was right after that transgression. And even though we came back to you two days later to apologize and recover, your trust did not recover. Relationship strength plummeted. Trust, which was so hard to garner, is incredibly fast to kill. So while you promise trust, just like in a marriage or a best friendship, once you lose that trust, it's extraordinarily difficult to regain. And so, so many of these marketers out there trying to promise trust don't understand the perils they put themselves in. What was equally interesting is the pattern with the exciting brands. Now, you started off initially engaged, uh, just like the sincere guys did. Uh, but you're, you're um, uh, the exciting brand. Oh, I'm so sorry. I kind of uh, explained this a little differently. But let me show you what happened in the presence of the transgression. So the orange is the sincere brand. In the transgression, I mentioned to you that your trust plummeted and it did not recover. But what happened with the exciting brand? In the control condition over here in the green, your um, engagement and trust in the brand naturally declined. It was almost like it was a fling-like relationship. <laughs> but when I, we, we had a transgression, um, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see the green. The, yeah, the trust declined significantly. Um, but what was interesting is that it increased significantly when after two days later, we apologized and came back and we restored the online photos. So when I promise excitement and you think it's going to be a fun fling-like brand and something goes wrong, you expect that. It's actually quite exciting. Um, <laughs> the ability to renegotiate the contract, to come through, to deliver more than what people expected actually puts you in a stronger position. So there's both the dark side of trust as well as the upside of excitement. Um, the corollary to that one is being exciting is underrated. <laughs> interesting, uh, interesting finding number five, cancer can be rebranded. So one of, the, um, uh, one of the research projects we do looks at uh, the conception of cancer, which we show uh, is, uh, is associated with being a bad thing. Uh, not only that, but cancer is highly associated with chemotherapy and the action associated with chemotherapy. So chemo is oftentimes construed as also a negative thing, um, especially for young kids who get cancer. And what I've done with some research at Hope Lab, which is, creates a DVD uh, shoot 'em up game called Remission, is it allows kids to play a shoot 'em up game where they take on the avatar Roxy and they cruise through the body and they look for ugly cancer cells. And once they see the ugly cancer cells, they shoot them. You know, independent of whether they're lurking in the pancreas, the stomach, the colon. And you have to kill 100% of those ugly cancer cells, otherwise they'll self-multiply right before your very eyes. 
Um, we show that one hour of playing remission for these young kids versus a control game, we, we use Indiana Jones, is associated with higher levels of adherence to treatment, overall subjective well-being, which is significantly higher, and overall survival rates that increase. Not only that, oh, thank you. I, I, Hope Lab is an amazing, amazing company uh, created by Pam Amidjara of uh, Amidjara Networks. Um, what's also interesting is the reason it has such a big impact on people's behavior and overall survival is that it shifts the affective associations of chemotherapy. Through playing this game, people think that chemo is something that I own. It's a good thing that's in my power, and I can kill cancer with it. So it's that affective association with chemo, which at a later point in time actually makes cancer seem less scary. The final... Um, the final uh, interesting finding, number six, is to engage others, be it for a cause or a nonprofit, ask for their time uh, before you ask for their money. And what we show in this um, set of findings here is uh, if you tell people a little bit about Hope Lab and remission in particular, and then you put them in three conditions. I'll say, listen, you're so inspired by Hope Lab. Are you interested in donating some time? And then we ask them about their money, and we put them you guys in a, a second category, so you are flipped, you're asking your money first, and you're in a control condition, you're not asked anything. And we come back to you all one uh, half hour later, and we say, you know, would you like to actually give to Hope Lab? You end up giving twice as much money as this group, and you're in the middle. So there's something happening that's very important here. Whereas asking for money first makes you disengage, oftentimes it's another nonprofit that's asking me for money. The individuals that engage people personally with their time oftentimes get people involved, get them inspired, and it ends up part, um, becoming part of their own self. It's a really important and exciting finding, independent of what my father says. Uh, so I'd like to close these last few minutes with a few of my favorite Dave Ocker-isms. As I mentioned on the outset of this talk, uh, he's had a dramatic impact on me, and one of the reasons is because of his Ockerisms. Um, one of his awkwardisms, which has affected me deeply, is, Jennifer, all you have to do is get three hours of deep, hard thinking done each day. And, you know, in the beginning, you're going, like, give me a break. You know, like, I'm, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. I'm trying to get a PhD here. I, I need to work all of the time. But I, I, I took a, a little uh, hint from him, and I actually asked a, a, a series of my colleagues, how many hours of deep, hard thinking do you get done each day? And then I asked them, how many hours of deep, hard thinking do you think you're going to get done each day? Um, and uh, this was the answer among the academics I asked. They got two, and every day they went to bed and got up the next morning and believed that they were going to get, um, let's see, five. 0.63. Um, so that means these academics um, are going to bed every day feeling quite discouraged. And instead, you wake up and you think just three hours and everything is icing. And that has been one of the key insights into um, sort of how we live our life. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I did this research survey with a bunch of my MBA uh, <laughs> students as well. And uh, the data is not nearly as depressing, but it's, it's up there. Uh, a few other David Ocker, uh, Ockerisms. Uh, that is the worst sentence I've ever read. Let me just tell you, uh, when I started producing research and I would give it to him to read, he would say, he, he wouldn't just say things, he'd write it. And he would spend time making it legible, which is a big step for him. This is the worst sentence I have ever read. Now, you probably thinking, that's brutal. You know, your ego must be this small, you know, at, at this. But I can't tell you how refreshing it is to hear such brutal honesty. And when it comes, like, I don't know, there's something about him that makes you, like, kind of giggle when he says, like, no, honestly, that is the worst thing I have ever heard. <laughs> so, and, and you just, and, and you kind of laugh. So it, I, I would say that there's a, a, there's a great freedom that comes from saying exactly what's on your mind, uh, even if it's just truly brutal. Uh, the next one is, I've never empirically tested this, but I have a strong suspicion that if you buy people things, they will like you more. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I don't know if you need to run that study, but I think it works. Uh, and for those of you who have kids, uh, my dad, uh, to this day, it is amazing. Um, the bribes that he gives his kids to hang out with him are unbelievable, and they work so well. I mean, 
I am go I'm definitely, this is like number one rule for raising my kids. I've got a bribe system that's uh, instituted into their childhood. There are certain people in life who, when you interact with them, the only thing you should say to them is, man, the weather is really good these days. <laughs> now, let me unpack this a little bit. When I uh, first came to Stanford, there was one individual who was just, just tore me. You know, I, was, I was in tears just all the time. And I, I would tell my dad, and just one person, everyone else was fabulous, just this one person. Um, and my dad would say, like, really? You had another conversation with him. Like, really? Let's, let's practice. Hello, blank. The weather has been wonderful lately. <laughs> Goodbye. So he'd make, me, he'd make me work through this. So all we need is a short sentence to extricate yourself. And I think avoiding people that annoy you or you dislike is an incredible key to happiness. Uh, and I have data to back this up. <laughs> One of the most important things you do when you start a job, carve out clear areas of incompetence. Um, uh, this is, my dad is so incompetent in so many dimensions, it is incredibly, incredibly freeing. Uh, he will purposely break things and burn things in order to earn the reputation of bad cleaner and bad cook. Uh, I got to tell you that I am a horrible cleaner and a horrible cook, and it is all thanks to you. All of my bad qualities. <laughs> did a great job uh, inspiring. If anyone likes more insights to the importance of carving out clear areas of incompetence, please email me. Um, I, I can't begin to tell you the research that I've done uh, with executives. One small snippet, one of my best students, um, uh, by the way, I, I always ask my students, you know, what do you remember about my class? And without fail, they will say, I didn't, I really honestly, nothing. Like, uh, and they, won't, they were not mean about it. You know, they say, like, I liked you. You know, you were, you were a wonderful, nice person, you know. Um, but yeah, in terms of what I remembered for your class, nothing. And this one student of mine said, uh, you know, I do remember that in order to make us remember what a strong brand was, because this is when I was teaching my brand planning, which is not a brand strategy class, uh, I said, you know, strong brands clear, carve out clear areas of incompetence. Uh, Lexus is not down to earth. Old Navy does not make high quality clothing. Uh, if you tear a piece of clothing from Old Navy, you do not care. You know, you'll go back and buy another piece of clothing if you're annoyed, right? And that is so freeing. And so I tried to turn everything into people uh, insights. And I said, listen, you should carve out clear areas of incompetence in your life. And I would tell the dad story. Uh, and so this one guy who went off to McKinsey, smartest guy I've ever taught, uh, and he went into McKinsey. And the first day he was there, he said, listen, I'll do anything you like, but I'm just saying I'm not so good with numbers. Just saying. <laughs> I, I, I'm, you know, I'll, I'm happy to do them, but I'm just not that good. Uh, he was promoted in McKinsey faster than any other Stanford MBA. <laughs> because he had less stuff to do, right? He was assigned less stuff versus the other individual saying, I could do anything, bring it on. And second of all, he was able to carve out a focus in domains that he was actually passionate about. And we have a lot of research to show that when you do work that you're passionate about, you have more energy and you're more focused on being productive. Uh, the final uh, Dave Ockerism. Uh, best response to a question is, that's a good question. I wrote a book that addresses that question. Have you read my book? Uh, it's, it's, it's a clencher. Uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, and never have more than eight words on a slide. Again, just proof that I sometimes don't listen to him. <laughs> I'd like to close this with a final quote, which is one of my favorites, Maya Angelou's. I've learned what pe uh, that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget about how you made them feel. And, um, and that's my ode to my father. Thank you for being here. <laughs>
they're, they're, they're so good at labeling things, you know, like the death tax uh, um, and, and on and on. And, uh, uh, and it, it, if you can, if you can uh, frame the issue in such a way that suddenly you're, you, ha you know, you forward the death tax, uh, <laughs> then it's, uh, you're sort of 80 or 90 percent there. And I think that, uh, um, you know, I was at a uh, World Economic Forum conference in Dubai last fall, and there was uh, 70 councils around, and they all were generating proposals that, that they couldn't communicate very well. And, they, and they, they, they really concluded they needed brandy help to, to somehow, you know, make the, the, these, these proposals they wanted to do more, uh, more understandable and more acceptable. And I don't know about uh, uh, capitalism, but uh, I think the free market system is definitely in a hole. And, uh, and they're going to have to get out of the hole by, by doing some some kind of substantive thing first, and then there's going to be a communication problem. I think you're right. No, it's a metaphor for for means something that's self-contained. So if you have a, it, it does come from the silos in the agricultural world. We have the corn in one silo and wheat in another silo, and they're completely separate, and they don't interact and they don't uh, communicate. So, yeah, that's where it comes from. Yeah, last question. Another very practical question. Well, <laughs> I, I, I would, the first thing I do is go to an expert on cross cultural consumer behavior. <laughs> right here. Uh, but it is the case that you, um, th there was a uh, famous paper by Ted Levitt of Harvard about 20 years ago that suggested that you should standardize marketing across countries. But most people, and there was a flurry of activity along that direction for about 10 years, but most people realize now that, uh, you know, if, if the cultures are different, you can't, in the, or the contexts are different, you can't force sameness, and you have to adjust. And so you, and one way to adjust, of course, is to have all these countries do their own thing, but a better way to adjust is to have a common brand and a common marketing program and adapt it to the different countries. But you know so more yeah, so. That. Um, you know, the way um, um, that, that framework that I showed you, those five families of traits, is, is one sort of lens you can use uh, to think about local creation of, of goods, or one way to think about um, how you could blend the global and local strategy. So, for example, um, exciting brands, um, pretty much every country uh, that we've surveyed at least, um, you know, which is over about 15, um, value excitement. But the meaning of excitement has nuanced differences. So for example, um, in excitement in, in America really means this exciting, cool, hip, energetic, young, imaginative set of traits. And um, in Japan, exciting means, uh, or tends to mean, um, exciting, silly, funny, cute, likable, friendly. Almost Hello Kitty-ish or something. You know, it's it has a very different connotation. So you can position globally uh, around this notion of excitement, and indeed positioning around personality dimensions tends to be highly useful, both tactically and strategically. But then you dial up the um, the the local importance of that. So if you're a small mom and pop shop um, in Japan uh, or starting a small business, uh, understanding um, that difference and then being sort of true to what you're creating. Uh, tends to be a more useful strategy than anything that's more globalized. Um, okay, well, there's one or two more. Do we have time for one? Okay, two more. Uh, over there and there. Go ahead.
Yeah, this is the dueling professor's part. You're trying, yeah, I, I see where you're going. <laughs> All right, so I will take my first whack at this. Um, uh, this, this, I, I would say that he is wrong. I, I, I would say, why not? I, 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 could don't, I don't need any data to say that. I can just say that. Um, uh, yeah, who knew? Yeah, like you probably thought he was right. Who knew? Uh, um, I, I think that, um, uh, I think that energy is very important. I think it has to do with momentum and trajectory. Are you making money? Are you moving forward? Are you doing positive things for the world? I think that that feeling that there is a company that's on an upward trajectory, which I think Dad would concur with, is extremely important. At the base of it, though, I think also consumers fundamentally need to trust that trust that company. And trust comes through sincerity and being authentic. And what we're seeing right now in the financial downturn, and even what Red Cross has done against the tsunami and Katrina, et cetera, is, is not done a great job of establishing trust. And I think what social networking and social media does right now is provide a platform for us to poke holes and promises of trust uh, and potential areas of hypocrisy. So the new companies that are coming out um, that are doing so in an authentic way. And remember, trust is not about perfection. You can be energizing, but do so in an authentic way that cultivates trust. So I think that's really the, the, the right way to think about it. My dimensions are orthogonal. That means that they're created to be coexisting. So if you think about sincere trust or authenticity, and then you think about this notion of energizing, it's, I think that there's a real sweet spot in that right-hand quadrant. See, I, re I reconciled it all. If I just talk long enough, I will reconcile it. <laughs> Jennifer's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> There's a book called The Brand Bubble, which analyzes the YNR database, which is like 15 years of, of data where they track, where they, every couple of years, did a survey that involved thousands of brands, 100, 100 countries, uh, 84 measures on each brand, including most of Jennifer's personality scale. And, and, they've, and what they've observed is in the last eight years, trust overall has gone down like 40%. The, the average trust associated with a brand has gone down 40%. So that's consistent with what I just said, just saying. <laughs> and uh, the, and uh, other kinds of measures, liking has gone down. It's, it's really, and one of their points is there's a brand bubble and that brands are overvaluated in the financial community because they've deteriorated so. But the exceptions are those brands that have energy. Those brands that have energy are, are driving stock return, they're driving ROI, they're not declining, uh, and, and so on. And so they've concluded that their prior position, they used to have four dimensions of a brand, uh, visibility, relevance, differentiation, and what's the Esteem. Fourth? Esteem. And, uh, and they say now that, that in before they said differentiation and relevance were the most important part of, of success. You had to have visibility, you had to have esteem, but it was really differentiation and relevance. And now they say that, that energy is more important than either of those. And um, So yeah, so dad's wrong, but uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, so we c this is actually a very rich topic, but I would, I would refer you to the Young and Rubicam database, which is called Brand Asset Valuation Study. Um, and what you need to do is look into the actual brands that have those energies that are, that, are energy, uh, that are going on the upswing, but also start to look at which of those brands there are. So Google, for example, is one of them. And I think that at some level, they've, they've had some trust issues, but they're very minor and they've kept it relatively contained relative to, for example, what Microsoft did in the 1980s. And so that trust is bundled into those few brands that are reversing traduction. Uh, the, one more question. I know that there's a lot of questions, but I'm also hesitant to go too much over our time. So we will be up here for a we little while. We haven't gone over the time yet. Really? Yeah, we started at a quarter up. Okay, we'll take one more question, and then we'll be up here for the rest yeah, of you. I wondered if your research is taking it in the area of what I call corporate suicide relative to branding. A couple of famous examples, Dots and changed to Nissan. My father's Oldsmobile, currently Yahoo, uh, currently Coke, silly Coke Zero. <laughs> yeah. What provokes companies to shoot themselves in the foot like that? These, <laughs> uh, all those uh, examples are interesting. I mean, the the father's Oldsmobile example. 
I mean, that, I, in my opinion, the biggest mistake that General Motors ever made, which is a, which is a huge statement, is that they, <laughs> they, they, they put money into Oldsmobile instead of Saturn. They had a jewel in Saturn, and they, and they gave Oldsmobile the money, and it was such a sick brand, they had to call it their father's Oldsmobile because nobody would buy the thing. I mean, when they came out with their, their new car in the mid-'90s, if they, if they took the, label, the Oldsmobile label off it, the, uh, the acceptance of the brand went up dramatically. So they tried to, to sort of hide Oldsmobile. In, and if they would have given that, brand, that car to Saturn, it would have been a, a whole different company, in my opinion. Um, but uh, so that's the Oldsmobile. What was the, the other one? Datsun and Nissan. Oh, Datsun and Nissan. Yeah, that. Going Colt Zero. No, Datsun and Nissan, that's another incredible thing. You know, they spent $200 million we're under with an ad campaign saying the name is Nissan. That was the ad for two years. They said the name is Nissan for two hundred million dollars, which was a lot of money in those days. <laughs> and um, cares. and five years later, Datsun was still as strong a brand as Nissan. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it, they thought you know it, it was a big ego thing. I mean, they would be over in in in. These executives of Nissan would be in a hotel, and nobody had heard of Nissan, and they didn't like that. Mm -hmm. So they wanted, uh, and it, it was yeah, it was really it was absurd. It was it was not a good decision. <laughs> um, so I, so in that case, it was an ego thing uh, that that the Nissan people just wanted to be recognized when they went in a hotel. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. Uh, what's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, there is like five different people, so um, one option is just for us to hang out up here and take your questions. So if you have questions, we'll I think we'll that's be here. Probably good. We probably do a certain time. Thank you, Jennifer.